Welcome to Ecstatic Yoga. I am Grace. So happy you are here. And we will be discussing a major yogic text overview. This is a Ecstatic Yoga Kriya philosophy lesson. And I really love this lesson. We've talked a lot about the eight limbs of yoga and we've talked about some Veda and Vedanta. Um, but this kind of brings it all together. So in this review of yoga, major yogic texts, we will include the Yoga Sutras. We'll do some overview on the Upanishads, uh, the Bhagavad Gita. And we'll be offering this philosophy overview with the intention of the wisdom of these texts to assist you in building positive karma and depending on and deepening your connection to the indweller, Atman, true self. And also touch on a little bit of Dharma. So this lesson um, will give an overview on the following. Definition of yoga and a timeline. Little history timeline for paths of yoga, yoga sutras, the eight limbs of yoga, which is also called the eightfold path of yoga, but not to be confused with Buddha's eightfold path. The Vedas, karma and dharma, the Upanishads, and a little on the Bhagavad Gita. So let's begin. The definition of yoga, to yoke, to become one, a direct experience of union, union of body, mind, soul, and the God of your understanding, inclusive connection with others. Yoga is an ancient lineage beginning over 5,000 years ago in 2000 BC. Below is a general timeline of the evolution of yoga and its roots. First were the Vedas, and this is our source of yoga. And this was approximately 2000 BC. Ancient Hindu texts that root back way long before Christ. Upanishads is one of the last and earliest, well, it's the uh, most more recent of all the Vedas. It's a summary of Vedas, and it includes the four paths to yoga. And that was 1000 BC. And Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, the eight limbs of yoga, 200 BC. And then Tantra Yoga came along. Yoga of techniques. Lots of techniques and burning off karma and getting closer to God. And that was in 1000 AD to 1700 AD. And then came Hatha Yoga, which we all know today. And ecstatic yoga has a strong focus on hatha yoga. And that is a yoga of physical effort, the asanas and the postures. 1000 AD. Let me see here. Tantra is 200 AD to 1000 AC. AD. And then hatha yoga is the 1000 AD to 1000. 1700 AD. So we'll clarify that. The Tanjali Sutras was 200 BC, Tantra 200, 200 uh, AD to 1000 AD, and then Hatha 1000 AD to 1700 AD. And then modern yoga is yoga of the present time. So it was 1893 AD to present. The four paths of yoga. These are four paths of yoga, four different types of lineages of yoga. And everybody seems to find a favorite. 
And as we've talked about this in, in the class before, but, you know, begin to think about what's your, what's your favorite path. And also it's really helpful to include them all in parts of your practices. Jhana yoga is a knowledge or intellect and it includes study of sacred texts. Bhakti yoga, which is my favorite yoga, is devotion, surrender, falling in love with your divine, divine of your understanding, your indweller. It is emotional, it includes chanting and loving and devotional chants. And acts. Raja yoga. I also love. I love them all. And I include them all in my practices. Kingly yoga. Mastering the mind. Very important. The mind is our problem. Includes asana, pranayama, and meditation. Watching the mind and clearing out those disturbances and distractions of the mind so we can be in meditation and stillness, which connects us to our divine. And then we can be in bhakti, which gives us that devotional spirit um, to love and devotion to the divine. And the last is karma yoga, and that is selfless service or seva, feeding the homeless, or taking care of children, or helping at orphanages. There's so many ways we can help others, going to the elderly and visiting them in nursing homes. Um, just helping a family member, or a friend in the neighborhood, or someone in town that needs help. Selfless service, it's karma yoga. And now we move on to yoga sutras. One of the most powerful intentions of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is quieting the fluctuations of the mind so you can become closer to the Atman, that indwelling divine presence within us all that lives in us. We can become more deeply connected to the eternal identity within our soul presence, for permanent inner peace and happiness. In the Yoga Sutras, the aims is this permanent peace and this permanent happiness. Patanjali gives a promise that if you can still the diversions and thought disturbances of the mind, you can attain permanent peace. It is quite a promise. It's well worth mindfulness practices to still our minds that we can come closer and closer to that permanent peace we all wish to attain. The fluctuations of the mind in the sutras are referred to as thought disturbances, distraction, ignorance, forgetfulness of our inner eternal being, Losing a sense of what is real. Living in the illusion or maya. It takes into account a dual-based philosophy in order to attain a true sense of oneness. Dualistic sy system of sankhya or darshan. Reality, which is also in Sanskrit called udusha unchanging, permanent state of our being, the eternal, authentic spirit, pure consciousness that we truly and eternally are. Illusion or maya in Sanskrit, the changing nature of the world, appearances, creation. Sitka of the mind is Everything going on in the mind. Shitka. Manas is thoughts, stored impressions, mental conditioning is our ego identity. Buddha, Buddha, pure consciousness.
conscious awareness, alignment with the soul, true self, inner navigate. Buddha. Ahamkara is the ego, sense of separation from others, individuality, identifying with the separate body. The sutras help us out of dukkha or suffering due to forgetfulness of what we are, being lost in the illusion of feeling separate, losing connection with our true identity, the truth within us, the eternal soul that we are. Our egoic mind stuff or shitka keeps us focused on the illusion, the outer disturbances which distract us from looking within and allowing stillness of the mind. The goal of yoga is to yoke, to become one with the inner being. Reality, becoming one with the eternal self, that divine indwelling. To make this deep connection with the authentic eternal self, we need to bring our attention inward. We need to go within. To go within, we need to sit in stillness and allow the diversions of the minds, the ripples upon the consciousness to become still and silent. So the divine self can reflect like a mirror onto our awareness. The intention of all our practices of yoga is to purify the mind, cleanse the consciousness, silence the ego, calm the distractions so we can go within and return to our natural state of pure consciousness, pure ecstatic bliss. A lake with white caps and choppy waves cannot reflect the surrounding natural beauty. Yet a calm body of water, glass smooth and still, is like a perfect mirror reflecting every detail of the natural world surrounding with great love. The ultimate goal of Patanjali's Yoga Sutras is to still the mind for the soul to reflect in all its splendor, to live in alignment with our highest soul truths, pure integration of mind, body, and spirit as one, to transform stress into peace, and ri rise above suffering and into pure conscious awareness, mindful and present, alive, happy, and free. Patanjali's Raja Yoga, Eight Limbs of Yoga. We have had a few classes on this. This is just a little review. The Eight Limbs of Yoga, also called the Eightfold Path, but not to be confused with Buddha's Eightfold Path, is included in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and is also called Ashtanga and a part of Raja Yoga. It includes a code of conduct offering guidelines to living a meaningful and spiritually fulfilled life. They include moral and ethical standards, precepts, and a pathway to enlightenment. The first of the eight limbs is yamas, morality. Two is niyamas, observances. And there's five subcategories for each of those. Three is asana, which is the postures. Four is pranayama, breath. Five is Pratyahara, withdrawal from the external world and diving into the inner universe. 
diorama, focus, dhyana, meditation, and lastly, samadhi, union. So the yamas, those five, the yamas offer five universal principles or ethical standards and guidelines for living a life of integrity. Ahimsa is non-violence. Satcha, truthfulness. Asteya, non-stealing. Brahmacharya, continence, moderation or abstinence. Apara, Braha, non covetedness non-attachment, non-craving. The Niyamas. The Niyamas offer five personal observances or disciplines to living a spiritually fulfilled life. They vary from person to person. For example, one person may enjoy a discipline of praying before meals, while another may enjoy long walks in nature. Discover what aligns with your soul purpose. Satcha, cleanliness of body, mind, and soul. Samtosa, contentment. Tapas, heat, spiritual austerities, effort. Svadhyaya. Study of sacred scriptures and the study of oneself. Ishvara Prandhana, surrender to God. The third asana is physical body awareness and postures. Four, pranayama, breath practices and breath awareness. Five, pratyahara. Withdrawal of external distraction, awareness of inner sensations. Dharana, concentration, focus. Dhyana, meditation. Samadhi, blissful union with the divine. The Vedas. The Vedas are 4,000 year old sacred scriptures that were written in Sanskrit. They are the most ancient Hindu texts that include spiritual philosophy that included hymns, they included rituals for priests and Vedic and Hindu priests in the Vedic religion. The very core of the Vedic teachings we'll co- that we will cover in this lesson are the following. Four chief Vedic collections, four levels of consciousness or reality, the Atman, Brahman, Karma, Upanishads, and Dharma. The four chief Vedic collections include the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, Yajur Veda, Arva Veda. These four chief collections are believed to be direct revelations from Aryan seers in ancient Indian preserved by oral traditions. The four levels of reality wakefulness, the five senses, also called Niya, dream. Sleep, the subconscious mind. Dreamless sleep, having no dreams. Rest, the soul. Superconsciousness, awakened awareness, true nature. State of samadhi, aware of singularity in the background. Simultaneously aware of oneness also called Tulia. The Atman, the inner divine, indwelling presence that exists within us all, that unifies and joins all minds. It is our core, our soul, 
our inner spirit, trusting the divine self and the divine self of others. Where Brahman is the ocean, Atman is the wave. One of the intentions of yoga is to become one with the Atman, the inner self, our true eternal identity, shifting our identity from a separate physical being to an infinite soul power unified with the divine of our understanding and all minds, to merge back into our soul power the depths of our being, the sacred sanctuary of our heart, to be in alignment with the innermost truth of our being, the beautiful goal of yoga. Brahman, universal consciousness, source of all that is, creator of all, universe, God, infinite mind, where Atman is the wave, Brahman is the ocean. Infinite source creator, sustainer of all that is, all life and all creation. The creative energy and life force of all that is without opposite. Brahman is the universal presence and life force that is omnipresent omnipotent, the light and energy that dwells within and sustains all that is, all life everywhere, including each of us. Brahman is pure love, pure love beyond comprehension, all loving power and grace beyond all understanding incomprehensible to the human mind and an incomprehensible mystery. Atman and Brahman described. The Atman is sustained by Brahman. Its very existence is sustained by the creator source, universe, God, all it is. Atman was created by Brahman, created as perfect love. Atman is an extension of Brahman, an individual vibrational frequency, yet completely one and in the image of Brahman. Just as a wave is one with and in the likeness of the ocean, Atman is one in and in the likeness of Brahman. Just as a ray of sunshine is an extension of the sun, in the likeness of the sun, the Atman is an extension of Brahman, in the likeness of Brahman. The Atman is your true identity. Hopefully this yoga teacher training will shift your identity, so that your identity rests in this eternal indwelling presence that is one with God, always and completely sustained and unified with Creator of Brahman Source. Atman is that which dwells within and animates the body, brings the body to life, like a hand in a puppet. The body is temporary and the Atman is eternal. The Atman has animated many different physical forms and bodies. Your Atman has animated through many bodies. Bodies are like clothing, an organic vehicle, sensory equipment that the soul can animate through, expressed its soul power create through its unique vibrational frequency 
can express and animate through the body. The Atman was created by Brahman in perfect unending love as perfect unending love. I love this because we didn't create ourselves. The divine Brahman source of our understanding created us as perfect love. And that is unchanging. This permanent state can never be threatened, is unchanging, permanent and eternal. The Atman never dies. The true self never dies. It is both infinite and eternal as it was created and is eternally sustained by Brahman and sustained in the image of Brahman, in its likeness. Nothing the body does can alter what Brahman has created, the Atman, the soul power within you, which Brahman sustains the soul to be. Nothing can threaten that eternal identity. Just as a hand can animate through a puppet and assist the puppet to do things, say things or experience things, when the puppet show is over, nothing the hand animated with the puppet has changed the hand. Just as a ray of sunshine can assist to grow food, shine through every kind of form, no matter what it creates on earth, its true nature as a ray of sunshine in the image of the sun has not changed. It has a permanent nature, yet can experience and animate through temporary forms. However, actions taken while the Atman animates through a physical form can cause karma good or bad karma. Can't change your eternal identity. God set that. Divine source Brahman set that as pure, unchanging love. However, we can create karma. The law of karma. Karma is derived from the Sanskrit word, meaning the Sanskrit word karma, meaning act. Karma is the law of cause and effect due to actions with the physical universe and within the physical universe. The term karma was first introduced in the ancient Vedic texts 1000 to 700 BCE. And at that time, it carried no ethical significance. Karma referred solely to ritual and sacrificial action. It took on its first ethical meanings in the Upanishads, the later genre of the Vedas, and was concerned with ontology, the philosophy of being. It became a more common concept and took a more present day meaning in the middle of the first millennia BCE. A Vedic theologian, Yajna Valkya, do my best with some of these longer Sanskrit words, established what was a new, a very new concept at the time with his quote. A man turns into something good or bad by good action and into something. A man turns into something good by good action and bad by bad action. This new idea of karma became moral and ethical in nature, and it became a popular subject within theological discourses with Brahmin, priests, and other emerging religions of the time. 
karma became popular, popularly known as a causal law and known by many theologians as the law of karma. There was a difference in opinion between the traditions of India, Vedic and Brahm, Brahmin priests and other religions at the time about the source of causal law. Traditions of India believed karma to be autonomous causal law, while traditions of the Middle East, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, believed a divine power judged and decided upon punishment for human actions. So with the Indian religions, they believed it was more of a personal thing, that the soul could choose to correct the karma in future lives or the, the, later in a present life. And, and then the more Middle Eastern, which was a rise in Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, thought, believed that God would make that judgment and create consequences and allow us to undo our karma. Traditions of India coming from the Upanishads and newer Vedic texts provided varying philosophies as how and why karma can produce effects over time and across lifetimes. One thing all the philosophies agreed upon, Indian and otherwise, was that actions could leave a karmic residue from actions. Indian theology believed this karmic residue was made of fine particles that settled on the soul, Iva, of one who took the immoral action and could carry it into another birth, taking the karma or their actions into future lives. And of course, karma can be good karma or bad karma. Yogic and Buddhist philosophies believe karma caused tendencies they call sanskaras and physiological traces called vasanas that would determine personality traits and fates in future reincarnations. An interesting concept of Indian theology, theology believes it, it is that good karma can be shared. The doctrine of karma The doctrine of karma states that an individual's an individual soul's karma is their own and specific to to the individual and the individual soul. Yet Vedic texts of the Upanishads state that good karma can be shared or transferred. One soul can transfer her good karma to another. Ancestral karma can be passed down to the living or passed on to a deceased soul. The law of karma from the Upanishads Vedic text is a simple concept of what you put out to others and the universe, whether good or bad, will come back to you. It carries over from lifetime to lifetime, unlike material wealth or worldly possessions. You carry within your soul an ethical net worth that maintains its value from lifetime to lifetime. We live in a mysterious universe. No one can know how karma will come back. Yet the law of karma believes that you will put out, that what you put out will come back in a form your soul chooses. It can be very different from soul to soul and lifetime to lifetime. Good and bad karma. In general, karma can be described as good or bad karma. 
However, it can take much deeper intricacies than that. Good karma. Positive and good karma is when you make positive contributions to others' lives, to, to humanity and your community. When you extend love, good energy, vibrations, good actions, and good intentions, when you help another, encourage another, smile at a child or an elderly person or anyone, care for a pet, feed the poor, good works take many forms, yet it, always, it is always endowed with love and positive kind energy. This good energy returns to you, often believed multiplied. However, it may come back in a different form than what you shared. A fortunate opportunity you get, or a, you, you out of the blue get a great position at, in your company. Money comes unexpectedly. You meet some kind friends. You receive a lucky break. You never know how it's going to come back, but it comes back. Bad karma. Negative or bad karma is when you extend hurtful, harmful, or negative energy toward others, towards the community or the universe. When you extend hate, jealousy, anger, and harm to others, and even yourself, you are building bad karma. When you extend negative contributions to humanity and the world is bad karma. That negative energy will come back to you at some time and in some form, maybe very different from what you put out, but a similar negative vibration. Or maybe it will come back very similar and someone will hurt you in a very similar way that you hurt another. No one knows how the negative karma will come back or even when. Maybe unkindness, challenges, hurt, or difficulties in life or in the future in this life. Maybe in another lifetime, you may face a karmic relationship that provides your soul the opportunity to heal the soul connection and replace love and kindness into your hearts so that soul connection is blanketed with love, not hurtful separation. Karma means action. And the law of karma, karma can help us manage our actions and to manage our actions to positively affect others and the universe so we can accumulate positive benefits of our positive actions. The 12 laws of karma. You want to create good karma within your soul. Live in accordance with the 12 laws of karma and you can accumulate a positive asset of karma within your soul. The 12 laws of karma are a part of Indian theology from the Upanishads of the sacred Vedic texts. When followed, we can accumulate good karma in the present lifetime that can positively affect the future of this lifetime and future lifetimes. So here are the 12 laws of karma. Number one, cause and effect. What you put out in deeds, thoughts, actions, energy, and vibration, you will get back. What you sow, 
you will reap. Mm. I love that. What you sow, you will reap. This law has also been called the great law in some Vedic Vedic texts, aligning with universal law of return and alignment. When you share, exude, and vibrate in the energy of loving kindness, the fruit and vibration of loving kindness is attracted back to you naturally. The second law of karma karma is the law of creation. You are fully empowered to create all your heart's desires in your life. This power dwells within you and takes effort by aligning with the law of cause and effect. Aligning your thoughts, actions, emotions, and energetic vibrations with that which you desire as well as practicing divine action. Our spirit is playing in a material world. And in order to gain materials, gain results, there are times we need to take guided actions to bring forth what we desire. We are exponentially empowered when we desire good for not only ourselves, but for all others as well. Three, the law of humility. Being fully present to what is arising now. Current circumstances present to your humble beginnings. Understanding you are neither better than or less than any other being that exists. We all share one unified field and are equally loved by our creator source. Knowing all power and strength come from our divine creator and we cannot succeed or even survive without this source others and we also need community to survive when you are present and humble knowing you are not in control you are able to surrender to a power far greater than your separate self-identity allowing that power to move through your temporary form by following divine guidance and taking divine actions in creating miracles in your life. The law of growth, number four. Being dedicated to inner growth as a lifelong journey, a lifestyle. As we grow and transform within our outer circums- cir- circumstances, naturally transform. As within, so without. Personal growth aligned with your soul purpose is important in the evolution of your soul. If you belong to a certain religion or feel spiritually drawn to embodiment, studying philosophy or therapy, that is what, then this is what you want to pursue. Listen to your heart rather than what others or the majority are following. Your heart will pop books off the shelf that you may need to read. Your soul will bring courses to your awareness and opportunities for your soul development and your soul growth. 
use this life's opportunities in your and your inner guidance to grow ongoing. Number five of the 12 laws of karma. The law of responsibility. I love this one. Taking responsibility is a powerful way to move through life and, and can supercharge your growth and create transformation. Giving up victim completely and operating in an empowered way by taking responsibility for how you feel and how you respond to everything that occurs in your life. The law of cause and effect tells us that the frequency we vibrate at will attract like frequencies. When we take ownership of all the circumstances of our lives, good and bad, we get the opportunity to shift our frequencies higher. When we notice we have attracted negative circumstances or people, and we can increase the frequencies that are attracting positive and loving circumstances and people. Outer world is a reflection of the inner world, always. Hmm. Always. The world you experience and how you perceive it is a projection of your own mind and your own consciousness. Use this to avoid being trapped in victim mentality. Victim is always toxic. And it is always low vibrational and powerful, low vibration. So powerfully choose to take responsibility. Give up all blame of self or others and look within to change. Number six, the law of creation. Yogic philosophy and theology believes in the theory of oneness, that we are all connected on a deeper level, that there is one unified field or one mind one mind shared by God, we are very holy. And this one mind unites all individual souls and physical beings. On this level of oneness, we all exist in everything and, and everything is transparent. Everything is one with source and shares all that is. That we are connected to all aspects of ourselves and all dimensions and all aspects of our, our past. Now, our present and future and with all beings and creator source. Hmm. It's a nice one to meditate on. That to love ourselves enables us to have love for others. And when we give and share love to others, we give and share love to ourselves. The law of connection. Seven, the law of force. This law could also be called the law of focus as it invites us to be present and single focused in directing our energy and attention rather than being scattered in multitasking. This law believes that when you are single pointed 
in your focus, you are more effective and create better results. You are more present. It is difficult to access the indweller when our mind is distracted and going in many different directions. When we can give the mind and if, when we can quiet the mind and bring it into single pointed focus, we can be in touch with our intuition and our divine guidance and creativity. Eight, the law of giving. The law of karma is about selflessness, giving to others and serving humanity and the world in your unique way. To serve another, help another, not for self-gain or approval from others, but for the mere joy of giving to and helping another. When an opportunity to give and be hospitable, be kind and helpful, it, it, and kind presents itself and your heart is aligned, you seize that opportunity. You help that person. To be okay with giving when no one sees. This is also the law of giving. No one knows pure giving for the sake of kindness of your heart. God knows all the kindnesses you give in every act of service according to the law of karma. And this is known and credited in your eternal soul. Nine, the law of here and now. This law is all about being present. Being open-hearted and mindful. Giving up the distractions and regrets for the past and worries about the future. When we are fully present with another, we are attentive and our love flows generously to them. When we are present, we embrace the moment with clarity. And we embrace the moment with clarity as it arises. Loving what is. Our interactions with others is engaged and alive. We are present and loving. We are living life sharing our love, and open. 10. The Law of Change This could also be called the Law of Evolution. As we grow in this life, we evolve and become higher and higher versions of ourselves. If we are stuck in a pain cycle, repeating the same past painful experiences, some pains, same pains, different forms. Faces, same faces, same places. Yet some underlying suffering, same types of victim stories, same unforgiving relationships. We are not growing up. And we are not growing in the soul. We need to upgrade and transform our thoughts and our vibrational frequencies. Behaviors and patterns constantly need to be upgraded in order to grow into a higher, ver higher and higher versions of ourselves. 
If we have the same thoughts, the same old grudges, the same patterns we had in the past, we will most certainly be and have the same outcome. This makes sense. The law of patience and reward. All great things come with hard work and not giving up even when you don't see the progress. All great leaders faced challenges and had many opportunities to give up. But when, but what made them great? What had them succeed in the end was tenacity to continue effort, to have patience and face as they traveled through the droughts, through the deserts, onto their path, to continue when there was no evidence of harvest, trusting the seeds they planted emotionally, physically, and mentally through good works would come to fruition in divine timing. This isn't about forcing doors open. This is about following divine guidance and keeping faith and being patient throughout the process. To keep that patience and that tenacity through the journey before you see the evidence of your good works. Having faith. The reward will come to those who persist through the ups and the downs of life. Don't give up. Unless it feels guided to give up. We do our very best and let go of all attachments to outcomes. We have faith that the reward is beautiful and the best we can imagine. And it is being deposited within our very own soul. What a power, what that, that a power greater than us our little tiny microscopic bodies will bring reward, even if that is another lifetime. And the last spiritual law is the law of significance and inspiration. This law states that inherent, our inherent worthiness as children of the universe, that we are all equally loved and valuable. We all have cherished gifts that give to give that make a difference in our own unique way. That in sharing our love and our gifts, we make a powerful positive impact for good in the world and in the universe. And even if we can't see it, we have created that deposit into our soul. Sometimes the small acts of kindness, what may seem like little charitable gifts of that the heart from the heart make a difference. As we give our unique and individual way, we will receive back multiplying. Always know your life matters greatly. You matter greatly. You are important to the world. And any good you put into the world, a smile to a little child or an elderly person, opening a door for someone, a compliment or act of service, 
is a gift to the world and yourself. We will always get back what we give out. Maintain alignment with your truth and give truly and generously from your heart, contributing positively to others, and the rewards will flow and overflow in divine right timing. So Upanishad scriptures. This vast universe is a wheel, says Upanishad. Upon it are all creatures, all creatures that are subject to birth, death, and rebirth. Round and round it turns and never stops. It is the wheel of cosmic consciousness. As long as the individual thinks it is separate from cosmic consciousness, it revolves upon the wheel in bondage to the laws of birth, death, and rebirth. But when through the grace of cosmic consciousness, it realizes its identity with consciousness, it revolves upon the wheel no longer. It achieves immortality. That's a quote from Svet Astvatara from the Upanishad. Upanishad, basic karmic, karmic theory. In the ancient book of, of the Upanishads called the Brihad Ara Anyaka, the sage Yajna Valka one of the earliest philosophers in history, introduced the theory of karma. He affirmed that all our actions, thoughts, deeds, and desires are never lost. And every action is recorded and responded by the universe. The karma is accumulated and can be used from lifetime the lifetime. It is beyond time and is stored within our eternal soul. The king's Yajnavalka said to King Janaka, quote, now a person is like this or like that. As it does, so it becomes. By doing good, it becomes good. And by doing evil, it becomes evil. It becomes pure by pure acts and bad by bad acts. And others, however, say that a person consists of desires. And as is his desire, so is his will. And as is his will, so is his deed. And whatever deeds he does, that he will reap. And that is in Brihadaran Yaka, Upanishad 4.4.5. And here is two more quotes. And here there is this verse. To whatever object a man's own mind is attracted, to that he goes strenuously together with his deed. And having obtained the end, the last result, results of whatever deed he does here on earth, he returns again from that world, which is the temporary reward of his deed, to this world of action. So much for the man who desires. And that is Upanishad 4.4.6. This is from Amrit Ray. Karmas are not karmas are not part of your soul. They are inert material like dust or subtle energies. Therefore, you can clean it, clear it, or transform it with proper techniques. Karma cycle. 
the concept of karma or law of karma is a philosophy that all beings within the universe and all life is governed by a fair and just system based on cause and effect or action and reaction. We discussed earlier three types of karma from the Vedas. Now is another description of the types of car- karma described. Four types of karma. Sanchita karma. This is accumulated actions. The sum of your past karmas from all your past lives. Sanchita karma is all karma accumulated in this life and all other previous lives, both good and bad. At this level, good karma does not cancel the effect of bad karma. They are simply in a storehouse and are yet to be resolved. Agami karma. Current present day decisions you are making and actions taken. The third karma is pra-a-badha karma. The karma you have accumulated in this present lifetime. And then kriya-mana karma. Current active karma. Ways to clean up your karma. Sanchita karma can be dissolved and burned away by meditation techniques. There are many types of meditation techniques, especially created for burning off karma, like the 114 chakra meditation. Agami karma can also be burned off by many different meditation techniques. With agami karma, taking positive actions in the present helps dissolve this karma. Dream awareness and therapy, healing deep wounds within the subconscious mind can be helpful as well because agami karma is stored in the subconscious mind. Most important is being present to life moment to moment Because our present life circumstances offers us multitudes of opportunities to clear negative karma and build positive karma. Being kind and helpful to others. Serving humanity. Maintaining a peace and putting forth peaceful actions. Being the non-reactive presence of unbounded love, thinking positive and inspiring thoughts, and feeling positive and inspiring emotions can help greatly. Prarabha karma. One of the best meditations for prarabha karma is mindfulness meditation. The all meditation repeating the sound of the universe is wonderful. Letting go of attachments is a way we can burn off this karma. Giving up disempowered ways of being, like victim and blame. Letting go of grudges and forgiving others continuously burns up this karma. Letting go of low vibrational behaviors, addictions, and habits. Being kind to all beings and the self. Spiritual study and ethical and moral behavior and actions. Most of all, knowing the self and sinking deeper into relationship with the authentic self the indwelling presence, and becoming one with all aspects of self and the God of your understanding. General ways to build good karma. Hindu texts suggest many ways to build good karma. 
such as serving animals, the elderly, and service to humanity, honoring Mother Earth and the environment, protecting all her natural species, donating to good charities, serving the poor, donating food and clothes to people in need, feeding the animals, taking pilgrimages to holy places that call to your heart and serving in the temples or churches or ashrams, performing acts of devotion to God, all positive actions, extending love and kindness through your heart to others, listening to others, being attentive, is building good karma. Taking time for others rather than just yourself. Helping others in need. Also meditation, fasting, yoga, pranayama, chanting, exercise, and time in nature and clean diet. Karma knots. There are three types of karmic knots. Brahma Granthi, physical connection, physical body and its survival and physical pleasures. Vishnu Granthi, astral connection, related to emotions and emotional attachments and bondage. And Rud Rudra Ganthi, causal connection, intuition, ideas, visions, mental attachments. Granthi means knots, networks, or objects. Karmic knots are based both in soul and physical form. And the more knots in the soul, the more ego we can experience in form. The knots can be reflected in our present actions and habits, both through habits and actions. The more karmic knots we have within, the more ignorance and disconnection to our spiritual nature when living a physical life. We release karmic knots by knowing the self, being aligned with our true nature and reality, practicing presence, yoga, asana, pranayama, and meditation. Here is a little quote in the Brihad Arana Yaka Upanishads. It's 4.5.6. Omiyatri is the self that is to be behold. It is the self that is to be known. It is a self that is to be searched for. It is the self with which is to be heard about. It is a self which, which is to be thought in the mind. It is the self which is to be meditated upon. There is nothing else worthwhile thinking, nothing else worthwhile possessing, because nothing worthwhile exists other than this. The theory of karma in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita defines karma as the universal causal law, where good and bad actions will determine future possibilities of an individual soul's experiences. Karma represents the ethical or unethical actions that can affect future circumstances in a present life or a future life. The theory of karma in the Bhagavad Gita is very similar to the Upanishads portion of the Vedas. Karma is the Sanskrit word meaning action or deeds. We have free will to choose our karma. Good karma brings good results. Bad karma brings bad results. 
Bhagavad Gita believes that karma is a spiritual law that everything you think, do, experience, and feel, and every deed or action toward another is recorded in your soul and in the spiritual cosmos. The fruit of your thoughts, feelings, deeds, and actions are deposited into this cosmic bank and can be withdrawn at different timelines. Indian soteriologies, theories of salvation, state that future births and life situations will be conditioned by actions performed during one's present life, which itself has been conditioned by the accumulated effects of actions performed in previous lives. The Indian doctrine of karma directs students and devotees of religions toward their common goal, release or moksha from the cycle of birth and death and rebirth. Karma thus serves two main functions within Bhagavad Gita and Indian philosophy. It provides the major motivation to live an ethical life and it serves as a primary explanation of the existence of evil. More about the karma and Bhagavad Gita. In Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna said, quote, perform work that will give benefit of all divine sacrifice. Otherwise, work causes bondage in this material world. Therefore, O son of Kunti, perform your prescribed duties for the happiness of all. And in that way, you will always remain free from bondage. Bhagavad Gita 3.9. So a couple more quotes from Bhagavad Gita. All men are forced to act helplessly according to their impulses. Therefore, no one can refrain from doing something, not even for a moment. Bhagavad Gita 3.5. And here is another quote, established in yoga, harmony and tranquility, and performed action, karma. Bhagavad Gita 2.48. A few more quotes here, quite a few. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five more quotes. The subject of karma is very complex and very hard to understand. Bhagavad Gita 4.17. One who is, however, taking pleasure in the self, who is illuminated in the self, who rejoices in and is satisfied with the self only, fully satiated, for him there is no karma or duty. Bhagavad Gita 3.17 Even if one is the most sinful of all sinners, Yet one shall cross over the ocean of sin by the raft of self-knowledge alone. Bhagavad Gita 4.36 The enlightened person sees inaction in action, action in inaction. Bhagavad Gita 4.18 Here's one by Amrit Ray. Karmas are not part of your soul. Oh, we read this. They are inert material like dust or subtle energies. Therefore, you can clean it, clear it, or transform it with proper techniques. That's a good one to read twice. Gives us hope. No matter what we've done, we can clear it out. Bhagavad Gita teaching on the self. So we have an unchanging permanent self, the eternal self or soul. And we have a temporal self, the changing impermanent self within the material world. And there are three attributes of the self called gunas. Tapas, dense 
tamas, not ta not heat. Tamas, dense, solid, stagnant, limited, and stuck. Rajas, more liquid, flowing, haphazard, irregular. And sattva, light, aware, movement, consistent, kind, loving, evolving. And the goal is to move more and more towards sattva, sattva the aware and light self. Purusha, Purusha is the non-dual interconnected holy open being that we attain to be. Dharma, whole new concept now from karma. We're talking about dharma. This is our last subject in this lesson. Dharma. Dharma is the calling of your soul, your inner purpose. The word dharma comes from the Sanskrit word dri, meaning to maintain, preserve, or hold. When you are living your dharma, you are living in alignment with your soul purpose. You are doing what you were born to do, activating your spiritual DNA. All things have a purpose, an inner purpose, and an outer purpose. Inner purpose, most important calling of your soul. Who and what you are. Coming home to the self. The realization that we all come from creator source. Your soul is sustained by source. Outer purpose. What you create in a physical life. Your career. Your service work your relationships, and creativity. Being a parent, a teacher, a doctor, maybe a lawyer, maybe a gardener, maybe a, vet a veterinarian. This changes over time, this outer purpose, and it changes during a lifetime, often. You may be a parent, maybe you also be a doctor, you raise your children, you may be a teacher, um, a yoga teacher, but in your later years, you may be a writer, or maybe you'll be a yoga teacher, or a gardener. It can change over time, our outer purpose. The term and the concept of Dharma was introduced in the ancient Vedic text based on cosmic law and order throughout the universe. It became more personalized to individual human beings as a moral compass and a way to maintain your soul's path in each life. It refers to an individual's purpose and highest spiritual destiny in each life. It is believed that according to souls' karma, their dharma is chosen and even predetermined. It is believed that we only progress as we move forward living our dharma, our soul's personal mission, our soul's personal path and purpose in our life. And then for our life. Following the heart, the call and pull of our innermost truth, our innermost passions, leads us to our Dharma, our truest calling. When we accept our highest role, our highest path and purpose in our life, we are serving all life and all beings within the universe in the highest way. 
when all beings live their dharma, harmony and peace pervade the universe and all beings. In yoga, it is believed that not only do humans have a dharma, but animals, insects, microorganisms, rocks, the sun, the flowers, all life everywhere has a purpose, a dharma. By claiming and living deeply your dharma, you serve not only your soul, but all souls within the universe. If that doesn't inspire you to live your dharma, I don't know what would. When we realize our highest purpose in our life and we live aligned with our dharma, it can lead to self-realization, deep inner peace, fulfillment, and joy, and union with our divine. Thank you for joining me for this lesson. I am Grace with Ecstatic Yoga. You can go to ecstaticyoga.studio for more information on our yoga teacher trainings and our yoga retreats. Wishing you a most beautiful and most blessed day. Namaste.